seems like accessibility has been all the buzz this year. Today on the podcast, I've got an expert who will share a few secrets. Welcome back to another episode of Design Today. I'm your host, Dylan Winspear, and we've got a great guest for you today. His name is Doug Collins. If you're a UX designer and you don't know the name, then you're probably not on Twitter. Why? Because Doug is the host of Hashtag UX Talk. It's a daily Twitter chat, and he's very active in the design community. Before I get into the details of the show, I wanna make another plug for the Design Today Slack community. This community has been one of the best things that's happened to me since quarantine. I found that since working from home, I miss out on a lot of socializing, and this Slack group fills that need for me. So you can sign up and receive your invite by visiting designtoday.com and going to the community page. After signing up, you can expect an invite in your email shortly after. Seriously, I love being able to talk shop with the people of the group. It's a great place to learn uh, and network uh, with talented people. Also, I wanted to let you know that I'm just a week or so away from launching the first course through Design Today. And are you ready for this? It's going to be free. That's right, this first course I'm releasing is a little course that shouldn't take you more than a few hours to complete. It's called the Resume Run Through. And if you're in this group and you need to get your resume up to speed, this course is for you. Stay tuned and I'll give you another update next week. Okay, so back to Doug. You're gonna learn a lot in this episode, even if you've been designing for five plus years. You see, Doug is an accessibility expert and advocate. Additionally, he's got a course that he's willing to offer for free to the first 100 listeners who sign up. You can see those details in the show notes uh, and we talk a little bit about it at the end of the show. So. This episode, it was recorded uh, over winter break, so I've been anxious to air this one. It's a great one, so let's get it going. Great. Mr. Doug Collins, the Denver UXer. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. This is awesome. I'm, I'm glad we could get uh, acquainted and get to know each other. We can thank the Twitter universe for making that happen. Yeah, man, definitely. And you're like uh, one of the only other few UX people I know that's actually in the mountain time zone with me, so... Uh, that makes scheduling these kind of things a lot easier. <laughs> that is true, actually. That we are the forgotten that. time zone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you joining me. I know it's a late evening for both of us, but uh, uh, really looking forward to this topic. It's a topic that, uh, it's, it's a hot topic, I think we could say. I don't know if I would call it trendy or not, but I think it's getting more and more exposure. Uh, we're going to get into some uh, topics uh, and themes talking about accessibility, but before we do that, why don't you give the listeners a little bit of introduction to who Doug Collins is and a couple of things that you're, that you're doing and what you've been up to? Yeah, absolutely. So I started my UX career back in 2009 when I was uh, uh, actually a failed journalist. I had tried to be a sports reporter and uh, things didn't work out too well. and ended up uh, having to work at a call center uh, for Nordstrom Bank. And we had a, a really terrible sort of internal tool that our employees used. It was written in front page 2004, and this was 2009. So that's kind of your first hint that things weren't exactly well uh, working there as far sure. as tools that we, we had. So um, I started my UX career by working in between phone calls uh, to uh, create a tool that worked better for me to do my job and then sharing mm -hmm. that and actually doing user research uh, with all of my other colleagues, sharing the tool with them, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, ended up, uh, being able to pitch that tool to our, uh, C-level management and said, this looks great. Why aren't we doing it already? Go out and do it. Um, and then from there, I've just kind of progressed my career through, uh, you know, a number of different places. I worked for a company that did interactive digital signage for a while. Um, so if you've ever gone to like a hotel that has one of those big touch screens that tells you where the meeting rooms are, or sort of where, you know, you can find breakfast, that sort of thing. Um, you know, did designs for anything from that all the way up to the big marquees you'd see on the Vegas Strip. Um, cool. And then from there, went into a, a company that did uh, financial services um, that eventually got out, bought out by E-Trade. Um, so worked for E-Trade for a little bit. And now I work for a company uh, called Khaki International. Khaki. Um, That's right. Yeah. So it's a very different thing than what I've been doing <laughs> leading up to this. Uh, because be directly before this, I was with E-Trade doing financial services stuff. Khaki uh, works uh, and produces software uh, for the defense and intelligence communities. And they're right. all about being able to track down um, sort of uh, the bad actors. It's like the IMDB, really, of bad guys is kind of the product that I work on. Sure. Um, so it's all about, you know, trying to uh, give intelligence analysts the tools that they need to be effective in helping to keep our country safe. 
Uh, so it's a very different change, but it's a really unique environment and some really unique security challenges. But along the way, I've been self-taught and I've taught myself um, everything that I know um, with a lot of help from other people along the way. But one of the things that's always really interested me is accessibility. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, yeah, you know, it, you talk about it being a little bit trendy. And, and yeah, I think there is definitely a trend towards paying more attention to it. But that trend is rooted in the value that businesses get out of it. Because when you think about accessibility, there are so many people that suffer from some sort of accessibility issue that uh, the return on investment for it um, is really quite, quite good for businesses well, to go in and actually work on that. Well, let me ask you, because um, speak high level, I, I assume that some of the listeners who are going to be listening to this podcast may not be familiar with the breadth of uh, uh, what accessibility actually covers. So give me some high level, what is accessibility? Yeah, so accessibility is all about uh, making uh, a site or application usable for people that would have any sort of accessibility issue. When we think about accessibility, we have a, a few different types of accessibility sort of issues that we might um, sort of encounter. So you have people with visual accessibility issues, either uh, low sight, no sight, um, or you know just uh, not very good things like color contrast, color vision, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, you have audio accessibility issues, people that can't hear well, um, and that could be manifested in a number of different ways. Uh, you also have things like uh, psychological accessibility issues, people that are suffering from things like uh, ADHD um, or anxiety disorders or that sort of thing. Also an accessibility piece. Um, and then you have people that are just physically limited. You know, maybe they don't have good fine motor skills. Uh, maybe they're missing an arm or a leg. Um, and kind of when we talk about accessibility and we talk about all these different pieces, you know, we tend to think of someone with accessibility needs as somebody that's needing those permanently, right? So you think, okay, if you're born without an arm, you're always going to have some sort of accessibility need. Sure. But when I'm holding my two and a half year old son in one arm and my phone in the other, I'm as functionally able to use that phone as someone who was born without one arm. So there sure. is a lot of that sort of what I call micro accessibility needs, uh, people that um, experience those accessibility needs on a moment to moment basis. Um, and that's where, you know, when we think about it from that approach, everybody is going to have some sort of accessibility need. And that's where the real value comes from uh, as far as a business is concerned, is being able to say, you know, we aren't just catering to those customers that are permanently in need of accessible options. We're catering to everybody um, out there, all of our users. Well, that's, that's a good way of putting it. I haven't heard it described as a, like an accessibility need. And I, I like your example of holding your kid in one hand, your phone in the other, <laughs> because I think that's something that people can relate to, right? Uh, Absolutely. Where you're multitasking, or let's say you're, on a softball team and uh, you break your wrist and that's going to keep your, your wrist <laughs> immobilized for the next three months or something like that. You know, how do you continue to perform your job? You know, right. so there are these things that come up that would cause us to need more accessibility features to continue to working on uh, as, as we might need. Yeah, absolutely. And even when you think about, you know, even on just a very fleeting basis too, you know, if you're a construction worker working in an allowed construction zone, you can hear uh, say audio on a video, Mm -hmm. as functionally as someone who was born deaf, right? And that may only last for a minute or two, but your need is still there. And so being able to provide those solutions is a big win yep. for you know, any company that's trying to build a good customer base and build faith and loyalty in their customers. So how can UX designers start to wrap their brains around accessibility improvements when it comes to a project uh, that they're working on or a feature that they're working on, whether it be contract or full-time, how can they start to wrap their brain about well, how do I look out for accessibility needs? Yeah, absolutely. So there is a good set of guidelines out there for accessibility uh, for websites. And it's mostly geared towards um, developers, but there's a lot in there for designers as well, too. Um, you'll hear these called the WCAG or WCAG guidelines. Um, I think we're at version 2.1 right now. Um, but these are essentially accessibility guidelines except uh, set up by the W3C. Um, that are, are essentially all the different things and pieces and tools that you can use uh, to make sure that websites are fully accessible uh, mm -hmm. for all the different audiences. Um, so going and just looking through those and, and getting a good understanding of sort of what those principles are is a really good first step. Um, there are, and one of the things I can offer to you um, and to your listeners is a kind of a, um, uh, what am I trying to say, a, a checklist of all the different things that are in those accessibility guidelines that are really geared towards the design side of things. 
um, like I said, there's a lot that's in there for developers and, sure. and the total set is quite long, but you boil it down to just sort of the things that designers touch or can be cognizant of. It's, it's a lot smaller and a lot easier to kind of wade through. And it really doesn't take as much effort, I think, is what many people understand. If you start with a good base of accessibility, it's, it's not difficult to implement, but uh, mm. it's much easier if you start with it than trying to go back. Uh, and fix things later on once you realize that you maybe haven't done as good of a job with the accessibility as you might otherwise. Yeah. Well, speak to that a little bit because I think a lot of the times we are going to find ourselves in projects where they were started long before we came on board. And if the right. company doesn't necessarily put any emphasis on accessibility, where should someone begin? Right. Yeah. So I think the the big thing is just trying to get buy-in from the other people in the business, right? Um, because in, if you don't have buy-in, you're not going to be able to get anything done. Um, right. So it's, a, it's important to make sure that you have those people behind you. And kind of, you know, apart from saying, you know, everybody has an accessibility need, you know, some things you can say to try and get buy-in to get people to say, okay, this is something we need to move on. Um, you know, some other statistics, about 1.3 billion people worldwide with a B have some sort of permanent accessibility need. Um, so those are people that are permanently deaf, permanently hard of hearing, permanently blind, you know, one arm, you know, missing fingers, whatever it might be. Um, so when you look from a permanent audience, that's one of your largest minority groups that's out there, um, as far as uh, users are concerned. Um, and when you think about, you know, that as well, you can also say, okay, if you look at just something like colorblindness, um, which is one thing that we consider with an accessibility piece, um, 8% of men, give or take, um, suffer from some form of colorblindness and 1% of women also fall into that. So you're almost looking at almost 10% of your audience. If you do nothing, but just address things from a, a colorblindness and visual acuity perspective, you're helping out 10% of your audience, making it that much more easy and intuitive uh, for that group of your audience to use. Yep. So if you could do something that affects 10% of your audience in UX, you usually do it because the return on investment in that is, is really quite good. And yep. This is certainly one of those pieces you can definitely build a case for. No, I think, it's a, I think it's a great input, especially when it comes to starting the conversations with your executives. I've got a right. really good friend of mine who's uh, colorblind, and I didn't know this when I first met him. And one of the first few times we hung out together, uh, we were at his house for a barbecue. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of my favorite, favorite stories with this guy. He, uh, he and I are sitting in the back. He's flipping burgers. And uh, he says to me, as I'm staring at these burgers, recognizing how dried out they're starting to look and how dark they're starting to look. He said, by the way, I'm colorblind. I don't know when these are done or not. So let me know. Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> that's not good, man. That, that's not a good sign. <laughs> I just remember laughing the whole time. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's the case. They're done. They were done about five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe put them in charge of the chicken next time. That might be a little just, bit easier. Anyways, it's just funny because again, you know, you might not think that you've got somebody who you might not feel close to some of these accessibility needs, uh, but I'm sure based off your percentages and your numbers that you're sharing, I would probably assume that more people are close to somebody with some sort of accessibility need. Uh, it's right. probably not as distant as you might think. So it's, it's a good mm -hmm. perspective to maintain. Well, and especially when you think about things like cognitive issues, things like ADHD, um, things like uh, anxiety and depression, um, and even learning disabilities. Those aren't types of things that people talk about a lot. Um, there's a stigma around them. I myself have suffered from generalized anxiety for years, and I talk about it because I try and take away some of that stigma. Um, but those are things that people struggle with and struggle with largely silently because mm -hmm. it's you know shameful to say, or at least some people think it's shameful to say that those are issues. Sure. Um, you know, even things like dyslexia is one of those things that's really hard to admit. It's also something I've struggled with too. I didn't realize I had a dyslexia problem until I was working for a, uh, a phone company, uh, cell phone company. I was selling cell phone contracts and kept flipping numbers uh, in the phone number, uh, which meant that I didn't get paid for that contract when I turned it sure. in. Um, so it's one of those things. They might not even know that they have an accessibility issue, but it's there. And yeah. anything that you can do to sort of make things easier for them is, is really going to pay dividends. Yeah. One of the things that I see uh, businesses think down the lines of is actually very similar to how a business might think of ex uh, usability testing, that mm -hmm. it's time consuming and expensive. Right. How would you address a business that says accessibility is time consuming and expensive? Um, well, first off, if you do it right, um, and if you do any design right from the ground up, it's a lot easier, right? 
um, it's much easier to say, okay, even if, you know, we've built an entire website from here and we're going back, we're just making some new features or that sort of thing. It's much easier to say, let's do this right from the beginning so that we don't have to go back and fix these pieces and invest that time later. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we don't talk about enough in the UX world, I think, is UX debt. There's this concept oh, yeah. of tech debt that's out there, right? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so if your code, you know, is slowly getting older and older and, and your site is slowly getting older and older and the technology is built on getting older and older. It's going to take more time to fix that as that builds up. Accessibility is one of those big pieces of UX debt. It wasn't something that was focused on, but it's one of those things, the longer you wait on it, the more it's going to take to, to get that up and running. So yeah, it might be a little bit expensive, especially if you have a larger project, but again, it pays dividends um, and to start doing it right costs nothing. Um, you can always say, you know what? Whatever is done in the past is done in the past, but we're going to do things right from this point forward. Um, and even if you just start there, it's a starting point. And that's a way to sort of get it on people's radar, start thinking about it, and then to go back and look and say, okay, what changes are we making in this feature or with this piece that we could implement elsewhere, take across our code base? Um, and you start to kind of build those pieces up. And yeah, it might take some time, but it's worth it. Um, and it's something that you can certainly approach in very similar methods that you approach to uh, eliminating tech debt as well. Sure. So let's get into some maybe of the nitty gritty specifics. What does accessibility in UX design look like when you're working yeah. on a mock or when you're working on a feature, what does it actually look like? What should you be considering? Yeah, right. Absolutely. So um, you really want to be thinking about those different pieces we were talking about, the visual, the visual pieces, the audio pieces, uh, the cognitive psychological pieces and the physical pieces um, when you're going through things. Some of these are just good practices and really things that we should be doing anything. So things like uh, color contrast, right? Yep. Um, so we say that we want to have a five to one color contrast ratio. For a lot of people, that doesn't mean anything, but there are a lot of different websites out there that you can use that will check contrast between two colors that you use. So for instance, um, your yellow uh, text on a black background is the highest contrast that you can get. You might be surprised here that's not white on black. It's actually, or black on white. It's actually yellow on black. And that's the, the highest contrast ratio that you can achieve. Those mm. colors are so different that they're very easy to see, very easy to distinguish from each other. That is called a high contrast ratio. Um, when you're talking about, say, like a light gray text on a white background, or a light blue text on a, on a gray background. Those are very difficult to see. Those are low contrast pieces. Um, so you really wanna stay at that sort of five to one contrast ratio. And if you're not sure, just again, Google contrast ratio checker. Yep. Um, and that'll, there's hundreds of tools out there that'll do that for you. And um, can I, if, I, if you're all right with me interrupting you real quick, one of the yeah, things yeah, that I've, I've done uh, with my teams, and I'm sure there's probably a principle around this or in someone's curriculum somewhere, but I always just called it the squint test, right? If you're looking at a <laughs> right. mock, squint your eyes a little bit. And if things disappear, you've got contrast issues. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, that's one of the things that, um, you know, if, if the text disappears when you see that, yeah, you've got problems. It's also good just from a good overall design perspective, because you do want to have good sort of page contrast. It's just yep. visually appealing and pleasing. So yeah. And it, it helps that my eyesight's starting to go a little bit. I'm not that old, <laughs> but uh, I, I am squinting a lot more. So I'm getting more of the contrast. <laughs> That's funny. But, uh, but yeah, definitely, man. Absolutely. And talk, uh, yeah, it's a great way to check to that. Talk to me about like font sizing. How does that play mm -hmm. a role in the design process? Well, so font sizing is going to be um, a little bit different. And again, it, there are font size standards uh, that are out there in the WCAG guidelines. Um, I don't have them in front of me at the moment. So I kind of uh, I can't give you the exact numbers for that. But definitely go check that. It's definitely in the WCAG under their font and text pieces. Uh, but yeah, you do, you do want to make sure that you're not making text too small. Mm -hmm. um, you do want to make sure that's readable. And, and one thing that I should tell you is that these types of the things are, are not overly difficult to test as, as well, you know, some of these things, you know, that we talk about like font size, that sort of thing. Okay. If you adhere to best practices, you can go ahead and, and make sure that those are, are kind of standard. Um, but uh, even other things like uh, some of the navigational pieces and that sort of thing are very mm -hmm. easy to test as well too. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to make sure that your font sizes are, are not too small um, and are, are absolutely readable um, because Again, it's not only just a thing with people with visual acuity problems, but it also can be a thing for somebody that has a learning disability, uh, straining and adding cognitive load to have them read and try and decipher small sure. text. It's only going to make things more difficult for them. That's a great point. You know, one of the things that I see a lot of designers struggle with early in their careers, and I don't know if this is a habit that they picked up on when they were in like grade school, 
Uh, but everyone loves to use 12 point text, whether it be on a website or an app, like 12 point font is where they start. And I, I wonder if it's just like, well, when I was writing my word documents, it was 12 point times new Roman. And that's, that's just like their starting line. But 12 point is oftentimes far too small. Oh yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And the line spacing too is another thing that kind of creeps in there too. Mm -hmm. um, usually you're at a, like a, a line and a half line spacing 1.5. Um, is kind of a, a good space. But yeah, uh, for me, I know that the 12 point thing definitely came from Microsoft Word when I started, <laughs> writing, <laughs> when I started writing papers back in, you know, the Stone Age. But uh, yeah, it, it still feels weird for me sometimes to see even 11 point text defaulted. It feels wrong in so many different oh, ways. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the default text. Yeah, but, but that's so small. And, and really, there, you have to kind of think of things not only in the perspective of does this design look good, but is it going to function well? And I right. think that's where accessibility really fits in with UX design because yes, we want things to look good, but we're not the UI guys. We're, we're really about having things function well and accomplish user goals and fit, fit user needs. Um, that's really what accessibility is all about. Yeah. Well, then I think down that, uh, that uh, same vein would also be the thought of like when you're designing an app or you're designing a website and the components you're developing, recognizing that typically the hardware that people are using have their own accessibility settings. And right. users had the opportunity to bump up the font size. And if your oh, components yeah. aren't going to be flexible enough for that type of thing, your app might not actually function the way you intended it to function based upon this one little setting. Right, absolutely. Um, and while things like font size definitely uh, can can play a role in that, you know, there are other different accessibility uh, hardware pieces out there that uh, we don't think about nearly as much. So things like screen readers, right? Mm -hmm. So a screen reader is something that someone with uh, visual issues might use to actually read the content of a page out to them. Uh, they have some of their own unique sort of accessibility needs that we can check for and help design for as UX professionals. Um, that uh, don't get thought of a whole lot and I don't think get discussed nearly often enough. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've seen a couple of people on my team do is actually find some of those resources for like screen readers mm -hmm. uh, and actually try and play with their product only using one of those screen readers. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the frustration is just rampant. And I think that <laughs> also helps people kind of develop the empathy for the people who are using the product and might have that accessibility need. A thousand percent. If, if you are ever having difficulty selling someone that your website is not accessible, download a screen reader for them and let them go. Um, <laughs> because 99 times out of 100, uh, that, that's all the, <laughs> the persuasion they need. Um, screen readers, out. yeah, exactly. Screen readers are a little bit difficult to get used to if you never used them before. So that you know, maybe playing a little bit of a trick to your advantage there. Um, but once you get used to using a screen reader, people that actually use screen readers on a regular basis are really much faster about navigating through websites than people who are doing things visually. Um, so it's, it becomes a very interesting piece. And especially if you find somebody that has experience testing uh, with screen readers, mm -hmm. um, you can really start to get some interesting results from that, really see how well um, accessibility uh, really aids people with visual issues uh, navigating through your site or app. Yeah, that's interesting. Is there any other components that you can think of that uh, designers should be considering as it comes to the specifics of accessibility in design? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that I always like to talk about uh, is an audio piece, especially when we're talking about uh, captioning. Um, so whenever we have a video out there, obviously audio is a big part of that. Um, yep. And this is also true with podcasts. And, and one of the things that we uh, talk about a lot in sort of the podcasting world is making a transcript available that tells exactly sort of who's talking, what they're saying, uh, sort of the timing between that. Um, you know, on the video side of things, when you have audio going, there are a couple of different types of captioning that you can do, right? You can have closed captioning, which the user can turn on and say, okay, I want to see captions over the bottom of the screen, kind of what we're all used to on TV, that sort of thing. Or you can have open captioning, which is essentially the captions are built into the video. They're hard coded. You can't turn them on or off. Uh, they're there as well. But sort of at some level, you need to make sure that you have um, an option for somebody with audio issues to be able to digest uh, that content. So whether you're doing it through open captioning, closed captioning, or uh, transcripts, kind of a big piece there to keep in mind, uh, make sure that you're making that accessible. Um, and really, is that's something that's a lot easier now than it used to be, um, especially with all the tools out there that are automated to try and help make that easy. Mm -hmm. um, there are plenty of different tools out there that uh, you can use to um, 
really sort of speed up that process for you. Uh, that's good to know. Can you yeah. uh, share with share with us a little bit, a couple of those tools that you're referencing or maybe resources that people can go and check out? Yeah, so I'll tell you what I do. Um, I have a couple of different pieces. So I actually, I'm not, this isn't something I'm trying to pump my own class on this here, but <laughs> I actually did, <laughs> I did a class. plugs are welcome. Yeah, 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 I tried to stay away from them. But uh, in this case, <laughs> since I have a class that I made on this that we talk about for accessibility. Uh, so there are two pieces that I have with that that I want to make available for people that are listening to, to your podcast. Okay. Um, one is the uh, WCAG, WCAG uh, designers uh, checklist um, that essentially gives you the list of sort of the things that you can look at. Um, and not that you should rely on that checklist, but it's a good starting point. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of relying on checklists, but it's good to kind of start and kind of review things. The other thing is um, a tool resource kit. So I've put together uh, a whole bunch of different links um, to different sites that I've gone and used through in the past, um, three or four different tools for everything from, you know, captioning software to, um, uh, things like uh, the contrast checkers and, and sort of other technical pieces in there. So that way, you know, I can give you three or four different options for each of these and they can kind of go in and kind of see which ones work well for them. Um, I want to do that both for a couple of different reasons. The first being, um, sorry, I'm getting a, I'm getting a Slack message while I'm doing this. That's probably not very professional. Let me, <laughs> shut, that, let me shut that down. Uh, Mike Gallers, if you're listening to this, uh, I will respond back to you later at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so definitely make sure that uh, everybody has access to those. But I want to make sure I'm doing that partly because I, I feel very passionately about that and partly because the, name of the, the exact name of I have, you know, 20 or 30 different tools that I, uh, I have kind of in that list. And okay. so some of the exact names are escaping me. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely a few options in that uh, toolkit and make sure that everybody has access to those. Cool. And if you can send me over those links, I'll make sure to include them in the uh, description and the comments uh, so that people can check those out. They can check out your resources. My hope in having this conversation with you is obviously we've spoken pretty high level on accessibility, uh, but right. for a lot of people, this is going to be their entry point into considering accessibility in their design. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is, again, we just kind of scratch that surface. I'd love for, for uh, the listeners to check out the links that you'll send over and we'll include in this episode. And then maybe in the future, we should do a, a follow-up episode and really get into some, uh, some more fine details. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot that you could talk about with any of these pieces and really go in depth with them. So certainly some good options there. Um, and really a lot to talk about. You could do a whole podcast on, you know, visual, audio, psychological, physical, all the different sort of technologies and uh, ins and outs of each one. So there's, there's a lot there. And absolutely, we can definitely dive into that. And, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll do too, um, is uh, I'll, what I'll do is I'll put out um, space for a hundred of your listeners to get the class for free. Um, so I'll send you a link to that too. So the first, now you've got people that you have heard right, and listening yeah. up. <laughs> exactly. So the first hundred listeners, um, and also if you try and get that class for free and you can't get it for free, uh, you can shoot me a, a message, Doug at Denver .com. I'll make sure that you get in there, but I'll open it up at least for a hundred. And then if we have more beyond that, I want to make sure all your users, uh, get that for free. Cause it's something I feel very passionately about. That's great. Um, and I, I don't care so much about the making the money off of it. I just want to get the knowledge out there for people. That, that's fantastic. And I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm sure they will as well. Uh, right. I also plug that uh, if they want to get in touch with you, you're very active on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I will plug that they should try and look up. Uh, what's the, your actual handle on Twitter? Is yeah, just... so I'm at, yeah, I'm uh, Doug Collins, U-X, D-O-U-G-C-O-L-L-I-N-S-U-X. Uh, you can also find me um, if you can't, you know, have problems finding me on Twitter, you can search for Doug Collins. Ignore the uh, Republican congressman from Georgia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's much before me. I'm getting up there in the race, ranks of Doug Collins. Fortunately, the Doug Collins basketball uh, coach doesn't have a Twitter fit that I know of, so that's good. Um, you can also go to denveruxer.com, uh, find links to all my social media stuff going on there too, um, along with links to other podcasts and writing and all the other stuff that I get involved with as well. That's awesome. And you've got uh, a course coming out soon as well. Is that what you're working on? Or is it a book coming out soon? Yeah, so it's a, it's a couple of different things. So I am working on a course right now on dark patterns. Mm. Um, so I'm going to put this out as a, uh, an ebook. I'm going to put it out as an online learning course. And I'll probably end up doing a podcast series on that as well, too, at some point in time, although that's down the road. Um, but yeah, it's something, another one of those things that I found myself being very passionate about wanting to learn more about and, and educating myself and thinking, okay, I've got a lot here that I can pass on and, and, uh, really help people understand sort of what they are 
Uh, dark patterns just annoy me so much. And for anyone that doesn't really know what they are, they're essentially the tricks that designers use to get us to do things that we wouldn't normally do on our own. Right. Um, so to make those decisions that aren't really in our best interest. Um, and there are a number of different patterns behind that and sort of design pieces behind that. But there's also a lot of psychology behind it. Uh, so the class and the book really explore both the patterns themselves, uh, but also the psychology behind them uh, as far as what makes them work and, and why they're actually effective. Cool. Uh, so work, yeah, working on that right now, hopefully, hoping to have that out, uh, feverishly writing away uh, every, every night, trying to get that done. That's fantastic. So we'll stay tuned and uh, listen closely for any word on that. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. And, you know, if uh, anybody has any thoughts or questions about that, uh, you know, feel free to hit me up and, and I'm, happy to, I'm happy to chat about anything UX, but particularly dark patterns, accessibility, those sort of things are right in my wheelhouse and always something I feel fun, uh, comfortable talking about. Great. Thanks so much, Doug, for joining. Uh, you've shared a lot of great insight, a lot of good takeaways, and again, some free resources for those who have listened and, uh, and check these things out. So much appreciated. Uh, again, I'll plug everyone to, uh, to go look up Doug, find him on Twitter, uh, and, uh, and take advantage of some of those opportunities. So Doug, yeah, thank you absolutely. very much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great time. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep in touch and circle back around, do another one of these. And uh, yeah, be looking forward to it. Thanks so much for your time. That's fantastic. That's a uh, wrap on design today. Thanks for listening.